concrete properties considerations. So I'll try to explain some of the jargon through here, but just feel free to stop me if you need me to define something. Our learning objectives. So first thing, this is gonna focus mostly on mass concrete structures. Uh, we have other presentations for reinforced concrete. So you can refer to those. Some of this will apply to both. But the overarching goal here is for mass concrete. So our objective here to first just understand what properties of concrete are important for risk, then how to set values for those properties, and then how to how to roll that into an actual risk assessment. The first thing we need to know when we look at our concrete and to understand its vulnerabilities is just when it was placed, when it was constructed. So our concrete practices have changed and evolved over time, learned problems and solved them. So depending on when the structure was built, maybe certain vulnerabilities or those may have been eliminated. So these are just a few of the big, big things in the evolution of concrete. So when we started using reinforcement, uh, when we started consolidating concrete with vibration, and when certain chemical reactions were identified and solved, like alkali silica reaction and sulfate attack. When we, when we go into our risk assessment, we need to understand our concrete and come up with our concrete properties. We're going to look at a whole range of evidence to try to nail down what these properties should be. This is kind of a hierarchy of where you would start looking through all of your data to figure that out. So our, our top one there is recent testing of cores. So concrete hydrates and gains strength, and it continually gains strength over time, continually changes properties over time. So the more recent the core is, the better understanding you'll have of the properties of the concrete as it sits today. Um, under that is older core reports. So same kind of concept there, just the older they are, the less reliable they are. Then we have field data from construction. So when we're placing concrete, we'll cast cylinders, test those cylinders for their properties and make sure like as a quality control measure. So we can look at some of those testing reports to get some idea of the of the strength of the concrete that was being placed. We just have to keep in mind that a lot of factors is uh, next is construction information, like materials, means, and methods. So this would include things like how we're preparing joints, where we're placing new concrete, um, what what sort of mixed design was actually used, and that kind of thing. And then the last one is lab investigations from design. So when we're doing a mixed design, we're designing what the concrete will be. It's common for us to do some lab testing along the way. Um, so those can give us an, an insight, but we have to be careful with those because a lot of times what was tested in those design phases isn't actually what was placed. So it gives us a little bit of help, but we have to be careful with that. And then, of course, it's very early on. All, all right, so now we'll just jump right into concrete properties and, and how we set their values. So the first one is concrete modulus. Uh, so anytime we do any kind of structural model, we'll have to have a modulus elasticity. So this is, this is incredible to know. Um, it's typically going to be measured at it's typically measured when we do a compression failure test of a cylinder. We just measure the strain on that cylinder. And those tests are usually done fairly quickly relative to, to static loading. So we consider those lab values as a dynamic modulus. So we use that in a seismic analysis, things like that. If we're looking at a true static analysis, if we just continually load concrete, it'll creep under that load. Um, and continually deform. So it's common or simple methods to just take a two thirds reduction on that uh, dynamic modulus as an approximation. Um, you'll also see a pretty big range of variability in modulus if, if you're doing lab tests on it. Um, so we want to do some sensitivity on that. Um, but those variabilities will tend to average out through the structure. So you can Typically, do a little bit of work to um, nail down a mean value on that without worrying too much about like, the standard deviations. All right, next one is concrete compressive strengths. 
So for our mass concrete structures, um, concrete compressive strength doesn't really control a lot because um, the normal stresses are pretty low in those types of structures. We can correlate lots of things to compressive strength. So it's still an important parameter to nail down. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about FC prime and what that is and, and why we need to be careful using that um, in a risk assessment. So FC prime is what will be recorded for the for a particular mix design. That's what's required of that mix. And then the structural engineer will go on to do all of their calculations and they'll assume that FC prime exists in that concrete. So we, we wanna make really sure that we are actually meeting that FC prime. So when we do a mix design, we're going to intentionally increase our target average strength for that mix so that we're quite confident that we're actually getting that FC prime back. And to make sure that we're getting it, we do quality control along the way. So what it has to meet is an average of any three consecutive tests must be greater than that FC prime value at an age of 28 days. So it's always targeted to that 28 days. And then no test can be less than 500 PSI. So in order to make sure that we're, you know, comfortably above that when we do our mix design, it's common that we design to hit a mean that's 1.34 standard deviations above the average. <clears throat> and then our typical standard deviation for concrete is about 15% of the mean strength. We're gonna do an exercise after this presentation where we're gonna walk through from a compressive strength to a dynamic tensile strength for a risk assessment. And we'll want the mean value. So we're gonna correct it with this information here. So just wanna flag like that bullet, go use it again later. So that's FC prime. So right, right away, our strength of concrete is targeted to be higher than that FC prime value that's listed in all of our design documents. And then on top of that, it, again, it's pegged at 28 days, but concrete continues to gain strength through its, through its whole life. So we get significant strength gain above that 28 day value. And then, Core tests that we core out of an existing structure are typically higher than cast cylinders. All of our quality control is based on cast cylinders. And this just has to do with the curing environment that those are in. So that again makes our in situ concrete higher than our tested values. So the end result of all that is the FC prime is listed on design documents is too conservative to use for risk assessments. So again, we'll, we'll walk through correcting that out um, in the exercise. Yeah. Uh, is, is this the same for old concrete placed 80 years ago and current concrete? It, it has changed a little bit over time, but I think the definition at the top there is relatively consistent. I'm not sure the, the date that it started, but yeah. But we've always designed to be higher than FC prime. All right, so we'll also ask you in the exercise to estimate what the current strength of the concrete is given the 28 day strength. And to do that, we use the terms of the test, which we're just working concrete through long periods of time to see how it gains strength. Um, it's dependent on the cement type. So this is <clears throat> type four cement, which is a low heat of hydration cement. So that's typical for mass concrete and Type two cement is another one that's typical for mass concrete. Um, so you can use these curves to age that, and the exercise will give you the actual equation for the curves. You have to read off the log scale, so <clears throat> but this is what we'll use for that. All right, so that takes us to tensile strength. So the main the main thing with tensile strength is that is that kind of signifies the initial damage to our structure. So it's kind of the dividing line between a linear assessment and a nonlinear assessment. And we generally will have to crack the concrete in some way to get the structure to actually breach and fail. So this will be an important one to nail down. And so that's why the exercise is based on getting this tensile strength. So these are just some major considerations for the strength um, for our mass concrete structures. 
They're going to be controlled by the lift joints. So those sort of discontinuities as we're placing the concrete, those will be the weak points. So we want to consider that. Um, there's different methods to test for tensile strength. So we want to understand what those are, what the strengths and weaknesses are, um, and what the strain rate is. There's also the concept of cyclic fatigue, and this is basically just the idea that if we load a piece of concrete monotonically in tension all the way to failure, it'll have a higher tensile strength than if we cycle it at a lower strength. It'll, it'll still break at some point. So over some number of cycles, it'll break at a lower strength. So we want to understand that when we're looking at our seismic analysis. Um, we'll talk a lot about stress strain curves and apparent linear strengths. And then aggregate size is another big one. A lot of our correlations and stuff is based on concrete that was developed for buildings, so it has small aggregate to fit within formwork. For our mass concrete, we have much larger aggregate, and that can have an effect. All right, so these are the three primary ways that we test for tensile strength, splitting tension, flexure, and direct tension. I'll just quickly run through these. Uh, the simplest one to understand is um, it's just how it sounds. Just take the sample, glue two platens on it, and pull it apart. Track what load it had when they pulled it apart and calculate the strength. So that's our, our most direct way to measure it. It's a good test, but it can be difficult to do um, because any, so this sample here is loaded in uniform tension. Take care of the cracks that you get along the edges. We'll have that same uniform tension. Our cracks attract the load and they um, just kind of like zip the sample. So those can fail at a lower strength than they would actually have in situ. Um, if we don't get that thing perfectly in alignment, you can get some bending in it that'll cause it to break early. So this will typically give a, a lower value than some of the other tests because of that. Um, it's good for us when we're testing mass concrete because we can get a lift joint in there and, and automatically test the lift joint um, and get a lift joint strength. That's, that's the most direct one. And then the next two are indirect methods. So this is a splitting tension test. So I think a, a circular cylinder has to be has to be circular. Place it in there and load it in a compression test. And as we load this thing up, that compression load is going to squeeze that circle out and put a little tension right in the right in that thing that connects those points. And then the cylinder will break at those points. Um, so you can kind of see the initiation of the crack right as the load starts to come on. So we can assume linear elastic properties, work out with that point load what the stress was at that point when it broke, and we can back out what the tensile strength was. Um, so that's indirect because we're sort of assuming it's linear elastic <clears throat> when it fails. Um, so that's what we'll call an apparent linear strength. I'll talk more about that. Um, so this is a simple one to do. It's not sensitive to those imperfections. So it's good for all those reasons. Um, it can, it gives generally the highest numbers because this cylinder will only crack on that plane. Every time it'll crack on that point, that's where the tension is. So we're not testing the weakest point, we're, we're only testing that spot. You know, aggregates crossing through it and everything, it'll crack through all of that. So it'll typically give a higher value. Then we have our flexure test, sometimes called modulus of rupture test. So for here, we just take a beam, load it at the third points, which puts a uniform tensile stress at the bottom of that thing. Once it breaks, we again record the load and we can back out what the tensile stress was at that location, assuming when you realize the problems. So I'm giving you that a kind of indirect method to give us an apparent property stress. All right, so there are some differences of opinion on which one of those is best. Um, you know, they all have their pros and cons. Most of the time, you won't have a choice. We'll just add whatever test you do there. So it's really just important to understand what the strengths and weaknesses are and how to interpret those results. Um, so, so now we're going to get into how we get to a tensile strength if we don't have any data from a compressive strength. 
And probably the seminal paper on this is this Rayfield 1984 paper that came up with these various correlations from the to, uh, to uh, tensile strengths. And he, he was one to call out this difference of current strength and um, the actual tensile strength that I've been referring to here. So when you load up concrete in a direct tension strength and you measure the stress and strain, as it gets close to its load, its failure load, that curve will start to bend over. It'll start to deform more as it approaches it. So the direct tension test is measuring this value right here, D direct. Our indirect methods, we were assuming linear elastic properties. So we were assuming this straight line here and backing out a value. So what we were backing out is that value A there, um, which can be quite a bit higher than, than B. So we wanna make sure we understand that. And sometimes we may want this value and sometimes we might want that value. For a linear elastic analysis, we want A because linear elastic analysis is assuming linear properties. For a nonlinear analysis, we want B. So we just wanna make sure we're tracking that. And the primary correlation we're gonna pull out of refuel is this static uh, tensile strength down here at 1.7. As our coefficient up at the formula there, right there, that'll be 1.7 FC prime to two thirds. All right, so that was that was the first publication on this, and then uh, somewhat later, Canon 1995 was a Corps of Engineers document that reviewed that work, came out with recommendations, and the recommendations out of that were basically start with that 1.7 formula, and then make adjustments for things like. Uh, aggregate size, since most of those data were the small aggregate, take a 10% reduction for mass concrete, adjust for direct tension, so take that and reduce it to get to the direct tensile strength. Um, the 50% increase in tensile strength for dynamic loading, uh, they agreed with, and then they gave some recommendations for RCC, so I'll just point you to that. RCC is a little bit of a different animal we we'll get into the team. And then, of course, none of this is valid for ASR affected concrete. So, ASR affected concrete just totally removes the tensile strength. So, from, from that and starting from refuel, um, we've sort of developed some best practices on how to set those adjustment factors. There will be a table and a couple slides on that. The other big point here is the lift joints. So, how much do lift joints reduce the tensile strength? Um, this is highly dependent on the placement techniques. Um, so if you've if you vibrated the concrete, it's consolidated, you've got really good joint cleanup, you can start approaching that parent concrete strength with your lift joints. Um, so we'll just take like an 80% reduction to be a little bit conservative for a well-prepared lift joint. So this is the summary table of all of that. Um, again, in the exercise, we're going to start with an FC prime value and work all the way through to a to a dynamic tensile strength. So this slide is going to come up again. Um, but the, the assumption here is we're starting from the splitting tensile strength, and then we can correct to different test methods and correct small aggregate to large aggregate or um, lift joint strength and so on all the way down. Um, so again, we'll use that here again shortly. Cyclic fatigue, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, just note that if you're trying to interpret model results and you're sort of approaching the tensile strength a number of times but not actually reaching it, you may you may still be cracking. Um, and we've given some uh, guidance here about you know zones of, of tension and things like that that can help you make those judgments. And then in our EM, and then best practices, we have these performance curves that can be used to kind of quantitatively decide if you're approaching that tensile strength with enough frequency that you might start to crack it. So I won't go into too much detail on that, but that exists if, if you need it. Once you've decided that the concrete is going to crack, then you have to switch to a nonlinear type of analysis. These analyses will typically use some sort of constitutive concrete model, nonlinear, and these can be very complicated, uh, very opaque. So this is just a slide to kind of say, you'll take a lot of validation to run through 
um, and you want to use multiple different concrete models and compare the results um, to see that they're similar. All right, our last one is the concrete shear thing. So once we've cracked the concrete and we've sort of formed a plane of weakness, then to get this thing to fail, it, it will generally take some amount of shear movement. So we need shear strength for the like two structural engineers in here. When we think of shear strength in a reinforced concrete design um, context, we're typically thinking of like a diagonal tension type failure. For these mass concrete structures, we're generally looking at some preferential plane that this can slide on. So we're looking at more like direct shear strength. So this one is just kind of a word of caution on using those direct shear strengths. So if you've got some test that runs out to relatively high normal stresses, well, for, for concrete gravity dams and gravity structures, we typically have fairly low normal stresses. Um, and if you have a, just a linear curve plotted through this, you can get some apparent cohesion that doesn't actually exist at some low normal stress of your dam. So really just anytime you're using direct shear tests, you just want to use normal stresses in the range of stresses that are present in your structure. If you don't have any site-specific data, a good starting point is these this EPRI, EPRI data um, that gives us bonded shear strengths over here. So these do have cohesion intercept. And then over here, unbonded, so sliding on an on a, um, open joint or a previously cracked joint, something like that. Um, and you can see a red curve here that's kind of a bilinear envelope in here to make sure this goes through uh, zero since it's an unbonded strength. Uh, lastly on shear strength is drain compatibility. Um, so we just want to be careful if we have a partially bonded lift joint. Um, you know, that bonded portion has a much higher stiffness than the unbonded portion. So that will tend to attract load until it fails. Um, so you, you could thumb the unbonded curve and the bonded curve. Uh, but typically, we just take the peak value off of the bonded curve until it until it uh, breaks that, and then switch to an unbonded string. All right, so so those are kind of an overview of the properties, and then we need to put that into a risk assessment. When we go into a risk assessment, we really just want to understand not only the mean but the variability in all of these properties, and how that variability affects our structure. Um, so for static analysis, you can do things like Monte Carlo analysis, where you just run that same model lots of times with changing up the parameters. Um, when we get to seismic analysis, it's a lot more difficult because these are much more um, computationally intensive runs since we have to run through the that whole time history. Um, so in these cases, we're probably not going to be able to do Monte Carlo in, in any meaningful way. So we'll typically just do some sensitivities to figure out which parameters are the most controlling of the uh, performance of the structure, and then do some sensitivity like mean and plus minus the standard deviation to help us assign probabilities. Uh, so then just these takeaway points here. Um, again, concrete modulus, we have to do if we're doing any kind of structural analysis. And typically, we can settle on some mean value without too much um, worry about the whole variability there. Concrete strengths for analysis. Um, again, static strengths. Try to use Monte Carlo if you can. Dynamic strengths. Um, you have to be a little bit smarter about it. Um, we'll typically do DC ratios of tensile, tensile stress to tensile strength in order to determine when that threshold is of linear to nonlinear analysis. And then once we're in that nonlinear phase, we're probably going to, you know, fear strength is going to be the most important thing for us on getting it to breach. And that's it.